So I got invited out to SIGGRAPH 2023, and let me tell you, NVIDIA was the star of the show. The world's largest single GPU. In Jensen Huang's keynote, Omniverse played a central role. You probably heard about the metaverse, but let's take things up a notch. NVIDIA wants the Omniverse to be a place where AI can learn in the virtual world, but also the place where AI can help you create virtual worlds, literally connecting bits and atoms. NVIDIA wants to help this $50 trillion heavy industry that is racing to create digital twins of their operations. And I had a chance to sit down with a person leading the charge on these efforts at NVIDIA. Let's get into it. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of hanging out with Rev, who's the vice president of Omniverse and Simulation Technology. I got to say that is one of the most cool titles. It evokes this like image of you with like an infinity gauntlet trying to connect all the infinity stones. It's like that that wasn't what we were going for, but I'll take it. There you go. Yeah, connecting the physical and digital world, aren't you? All right, so you spent over two decades at NVIDIA now. And so outside looking in, it really feels like NVIDIA saw something that no one else saw, right? And sort of put in place this critical backbone infrastructure that powers utility, delight, everything in between. And you all did this despite the stock market not always agreeing. So how does one take such a long-term view? Was it a part of the strategy? Was it prescience? And what was your view from the inside? Well, I mean, first and foremost, it's it's Jensen Wong, I mean, our CEO, the founder of our company. He is prescient, and uh, it's not like it's a secret either. If you go if you go back to his keynotes from 10, 15, 20 years ago, just I I, I encourage you to go check it out. You'll see everything that's happened now. There were signals of it in his keynote then. Totally. We started talking about Moore's law dying. Uh, back in 2006, I believe, mm. we invented CUDA, and we put CUDA in every one of our chips, uh, all the way down to our consumer class chips, so that um, what Jensen wanted was to ensure that anyone can develop on, on CUDA and enjoy it and use it. He predicted one day a grad student <laughs> is going to be traveling to, to a conference to present their work, and they're going to need to develop on their GeForce laptop. Yeah. And so so we ensured CUDA would be there to do that so we could find the killer app. And then when it happened in 2012, it was AlexNet, totally. the, uh, and Jeff Hinton's group, Alex Krzyzewski, Ilya. Ilya yeah. um, it happened exactly like he predicted. Uh, CUDA, on top of our gaming PCs, created the uh, conditions for this killer app to emerge. It's not even an app, it's just a new form of computing. Totally. And, and when that happened, we saw it. And so we jumped all in on it from the very start and laid the foundations for where we are today. And so just go look back at all the keynotes, every, everything we've said publicly. Back when he first said those things, like Moore's Law is dying, the ability to uh, get 10 times... A lot of people kind of laughed at it. What are you talking about, Jensen? Yeah, yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. But he was right. And yeah. this is why we're here. You can absolutely see slivers of this, like, universal compute architecture, accelerated compute, as you all call it, right? Like, happening. And so it's funny that gaming subsidized, you know, all this infrastructure that is now central to how, you know, how AI models are trained and obviously deployed, too, right? Yeah, I think... Uh, to, to people who don't know what's involved with computer graphics and simulating virtual worlds, it seems kind of strange that an entertainment thing, something that, and totally. gaming in particular, the word game ev evokes toy. Oh, yeah. Like it's something simple, right? Uh, but nothing is further from the truth. Creating those images that we experience in visual effects and in, uh, and in video games it's a, it's a simulation of the laws of physics. And there's essentially no limit to the amount of compute power you could throw at that problem. Yeah. To get closer and closer to the richness and complexity of the real world around us, and with the scale of the real world, we can consume all of the compute we will ever create totally. to, to try to do that problem. Which is why Jensen selected it as the first problem for NVIDIA to try to go tackle. Uh, video games had a, had two great things going for it. One, 
the potential of the market was very large. So if it was successful, then we could fund continuing to do more research and development in our, in our chips and the full stack moving forward. Um, and the, the other is that it's an endless problem. No matter how much we do, totally, it's not enough. So we could keep justifying putting more into it. Uh, it's also rendering in specific is of a class of problems called embarrassingly parallel. <laughs> and it's, they're called embarrassingly parallel because if you don't parallelize your code, yeah, you should be you should bear embarrassed. You should be embarrassed <laughs> about it. Uh, and rendering is a great one. Essentially, you could throw, you know, a simplistic way to look at it is you can use a whole processor per pixel, or yeah. or uh, just parallelize across vertices or all of the things that are totally. that are inside this world. Um, there's a lot of other problems that are also embarrassingly pr parallel. Uh, physics problems tend to be hmm. embarrassingly parallel. So it wasn't a big jump to go from rendering to other other algorithms, other uh, applications of totally. this type of compute. Uh, the key was when we introduced programmable shading. Mm -hmm. That's around the time I joined. I worked on the first shading language cool. uh, we created called CG at the time, which you can think of as sort of the precursors to CUDA. Okay. Yeah. And once we introduced that, um, we quickly noticed a lot of researchers started harnessing the compute power inside our consumer gaming GPUs yeah. to go solve things that had nothing to do with computer graphics. They would apply to molecular dynamics or n-body simulation. Mm. Um, and when we saw that, we said, okay, well, we should give them a proper way to, to harness this power. They shouldn't have to phrase their problems as a rendering problem yeah. and fit it through our graphics APIs, and we created CUDA. That's amazing. And honestly, what a beautiful transition to the software side of things, right? You've got this kind of unified hardware architecture. And it's intriguing how, you know, various technologies originally designed for these bespoke purposes, you know, natural language processing, you alluded to rendering and simulation, physics simulation, and now image generation, they're sort of converging in a way that, you know, you know, it, it's greater than the sum of its parts, right? And it seems like Omniverse is sort of at the nexus of all of these things. I dare I call it like a Voltron or T-1000 where all the capabilities are sort of coming together. Is that the right way to think about Omniverse? Like one place where you take all these technologies that were either, you know, like battle tested for ML in the research world or, you know, in, in gaming for, you know, physics simulations and, and things like that on the gaming side of things like, and then, you know, how do you envision the future interplay of all these technologies progressing? Yes, there's a, a lot of what you said, I think, it, um, makes sense. And it, it, it kind of does come together that way. But I'd structure it a little bit differently. Sure, let's hear it. Um, if you look at the history of NVIDIA, the way I see it, there's been essentially three different eras. The first era was all about rendering which is the simulation of the physics of light and matter, how mm. light interacts totally. with matter and, and allows us to reconstruct what a, what a sensor might have experienced yeah. inside that virtual world. When we introduced programmable shading and CUDA came about, we extended our uh, processing to other types of physics simulation. We could do fluids and rigid body dynamics and cloth and uh, all the other stuff we could totally. do. CUDA yeah. unlocked all of those things. So the second era was about high performance computing and physics simulation. Uh, 2012, big bang of AI, AlexNet happens. And the same, the same platform was now used to simulate intelligence. Totally. We can simulate specific intelligence with the networks where we, we were creating then. And now they're becoming more and more general, smarter and more general. So you take these three things, the simulation of the physics of light and matter, how things look, yeah. you know, how they appear to us, how we perceive it in the world. Uh, the physics, simulation of general physics, yeah. and which is the physics the of the world, uh, yeah. the rules of the world, simulating okay. that. And the simulation of intelligence, AI, and you kind of have all the ingredients you need to simulate everything in the world. Totally, yeah. Huh? So when AI showed up, uh, we cl quickly realized the, um, there's a fundamental change in how all software is going to be developed in the future. Uh, uh, at that moment, we realized that there was now a solution to a problem that had existed for decades that all of us thought we would probably not see in our lifetimes. 
Alex Dent was able to tell the difference between a cat and a dog robustly uh, when he provided these images to it. We'd been trying to do that very problem of classification yeah. since like the 50s. Yeah, symbolic and, approaches didn't work, right? Yeah, they just didn't work. Um, you, you couldn't take a really smart human, have them come up with some ideas, turn it into a program in a text editor, compile it, and get a program out that, that did this thing. Uh, the way we solved it is by essentially writing a program that we then fed a whole bunch of data, which was now available to us because of the internet, it was ImageNet, yep. um, and, and then did a whole bunch of compute, a whole bunch of processing, so that this program produced a program. It produced an algorithm. And it produced an algorithm that we can't directly understand. There's an indirection in it. So that essentially unlocked the possibility that all these other algorithms we've been wanting to create that we had thought were not attainable by us were now attainable, potentially, given you have the right data and enough compute. Now, the question is, how do you get this data? The way, you look, the way I look at the data, the images we gave to AlexNet and all these other perception networks, um, you can kind of think of it as an encoding of life experience. Totally, yeah. You know, babies, they learn, um, they learn how to see. Yeah. When they come out into the world. Observations they learn of the world over time, right? Right. They learn how to understand who is their mother, father, siblings. Totally. That's classification. Yeah. Learn depth perception. Yeah. Learn uh, physics. Uh, putting blocks together. And then together. they start doing yeah. experiments in the world, yeah. not throwing objects around, right. fluid dynamics until they, they totally. get a hang of these things, right? Yeah. Uh, AIs learn in exactly the same way. Totally. Through trial and error and through feeding it a lot of life experience. Well, then the question is, if this is how they learn, how are we going to provide them this life experience? Certainly. How do we provide enough of it? How do we provide the right um, uh, right type of life experience? Yeah. A diverse set of life experience so that they all really the understand. All the long-tail scenarios. Right? All, all of that stuff. How do you do it safely? I mean, we don't want our self-driving cars to learn like our babies on the road. Yeah, totally. That would be really dangerous. <laughs> we don't want them operating heavy machinery yeah. in a factory and learning on the job. We need them to learn in a safe place. And so it turned out that everything we had been doing for 20 plus years uh, created the right conditions for us to create a world simulator yeah. that we could then use as the playground, as the sandbox for these AIs to learn. To learn how to see the world, to perceive it, and how to manipulate it. I love that. So once. Once you have that, um, then that starts to help you. And this is where I think you you were talking about a loop forming. Yeah. Um, if I may just briefly interject here, I mean, so what you're alluding to, whether it's about training autonomous systems or you know optimizing physical processes in the world, you have the ability to sort of yeah like simulate the world of atoms and create all these scenarios and have these agents that learn. Um, in these simulations of the real world to then be better at navigating in the real world, right? And it's like it, it, the one of the most interesting collaborations you highlighted here was uh, Boston Dynamics AI Institute. And so I'm curious now, like you mentioned AI and simulation, you just happen to be uniquely positioned to take on this problem. How has that focus on simulation shaped the trajectory of the Omniverse platform? Because one of the other things you said this morning is that Omniverse primarily caters to non-entertainment digital twins talk more about that well for entertainment yeah. there are already some great simulators that exist out there totally. they're game engines if you're gonna totally. if you're gonna build games um, the problems that you have are best solved by by engines that are already targeting that and we work closely with with anybody developing games and game engines to ensure that their engines are optimal on our hardware the full stack and we take their uh, and any learnings we have from them and factor them into each generation of our GPUs and so on and so forth. Um, initially, we tried to use game engines to do simulation for robotics for autonomous vehicles. Uh, we, we always prefer not to reinvent things that already exist. There's no point in creating something if it's already there. 
We'd rather channel all of the energy of our ener engineers and all our brilliant minds to doing new things that haven't been done before. But it turned out that the problem of uh, simulating things with physical accuracy and making it real time uh, required us to scale the computation to computers that are bigger than the ones that typically run games. Data center scale, right? Eventually data center, uh, yeah. supercomputers. Uh, for a game developer, your primary problem, the thing that you need to solve is how do you get enough gamers to play your game so you can make enough money to justify making the game to begin with. Right. And that means you want it to run on as small a computer as possible because totally. that increases the addressable market totally. for you. Game engines are generally tuned for that. They're yeah. tuned to run on consoles, even on mobile phones yeah. or, or small clients, machines. clients, basically, right? Yeah. But if you go take your, your gaming PC and put three more GPUs in there, yeah. it's not going to make a difference for your game. Right. They're, not, they're not designed to scale up in this way. Yeah. Um, we also, five years ago, were in the process of reinventing graphics with RTX and ray tracing, which unlocked the possibility of doing truer simulations of how light interacts with matter. And so we felt that that was the right moment for us to build a new kind of simulation engine, one that's targeted at being as physically accurate as possible while being real time, but capable of running on computers uh, that are larger and that can scale up. So if you have a specific problem, you have a certain world that you need to simulate with a certain physical accuracy level, uh, you can match the amount of compute to that problem to keep it real time or maybe even super real time. I love that. Yeah, it's like uh, take all those long tail scenarios for self-driving, send it up to the cloud. You get some beautiful like, you know, semantic segmentation, ground truth that pops out at the other end. There's also like a bunch of creative tools that are coming into Omniverse, right? Like, so we heard about Adobe Fireflies integration. There's the Shutterstock Text at 360 feature. So it's like there's all these like entertainment esque use cases, maybe not entertain, but they at least get into the commerce realm. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about that too? Because I found it very interesting where the holy, I mean, first off, people debate the definition of digital twin to, to death, right? But this concept of this like one digital twin to rule them all, which was exemplified by the car customizer example you all talked about with Denza and WPP, this single unified asset from like CAD CAM to final distribution across marketing channels. Like that's the holy grail. How does NVIDIA facilitate the creation and maintenance of these type of digital twins? Yeah, that's, uh, it's the holy grail because it's really, really hard. Yeah. <laughs> any any uh, remotely uh, complex 3D thing that you're trying to do generally involves multiple tools. Right. And um, even today, it's practically impossible to have data flow from one tool into another and then back without losing information. You always lose information uh, every step of the way with these export import processes. Totally. Every, every tool has a different way of looking at the, the world. Yeah, even you the up axis, right? Yeah. Um, if, if we are to build true digital twins and simulations of worlds, we need a representation that's lossless. And that's a superset of all the things that all the tools can describe. Right. And so we started, when we started on this journey to create a, a world simulator, we realized that that's actually the first problem that needs to be solved. All of the stuff that's in our world, um, they come from different places. People use different tools. Stuff in digital worlds are the same thing. Uh, buildings are designed by architects using their particular tools, Revit, SketchUp, ArchiCAD, yeah. whatever. Um, people who, who design things for manufacturing, they use various CAD tools. They yeah. could use Siemens NX or uh, CATIA or Fusion or, 360. Fusion 360. Yeah. Um, those that are creating humans for visual effects, Maya. they use tools like Maya, right? And yeah. so on and so forth. Um, in the world, we have all of those types of things all together. So how do we bring them all into one world without losing that information? So at that point, we saw USD had been open sourced. Uh, Pixar's uh, universal scene description said this, this is not there yet, but 
we can see it getting there to the point where we can have this holy grail of having all of the information to describe everything in the world coming from every tool without losing information eventually happen. We just have to keep building on top of that and add new schemas and uh, uh, layers and layers of information. Uh, and the bones of USD were great already. Totally. It's already really designed. It's 30 years of Pixar's experience building large virtual worlds yeah. using a large set of heterogeneous tools with different uh, specialists in different departments all working together. This is the culmination of that. So we thought, let's, let's start from that. It felt to us sort of like how HTML did in the early days. Yeah. HTML1 was very basic. All you could do was combine some text with images and hyperlinks. Yeah. But you fast forward to HTML5 almost, uh, I, what was that like? Almost 20 years later, I think it was like 18 years later. And we can have Google Earth running inside, uh, inside your web browser. It's pretty oh. amazing. So we think the same it will happen with USD, but much faster because we're starting from a uh, already a much richer base. And we also know what happened with the web and HTML and everything else. So we can we can accelerate this process. So once you have all that, uh, you have a common way of describing all of these things. Uh, the pipelines get simpler. Instead of having a pipeline where data is flowing from one tool into another and into another and then forking off and merging back together, uh, you just have one source of truth, which is the data, that the USD, and every tool just kind of connects into it. You can go contribute and you can read back. And you can only deal with the stuff you understand and leave the stuff you don't understand alone. It completely simplifies the pipeline and, and uh, offers the opportunity to not lose information anymore. Totally. I mean, when people talk about the the metaverse, which is obviously deeply in vogue last year, um, you know, interoperability is such a key part of it. And you're totally right. This like ill-tailored tapestry of like formats and interchange. Yeah, just like it's this like very kludgy process to duct tape these things together. So in many ways, it seems like Omniverse and now OpenUSD, which obviously you all are putting your full force behind, is sort of like this connective tissue or substrate between all these 3D applications. They can finally like talk to the same source of truth and like populate these digital worlds. That's exactly right. I mean, imagine if uh, in 1993, when Mosaic, the first web browser came yeah. out, it had some, some hypertext markup language version and then another one pops up, Netscape yeah. and Internet Explorer, and each one has something that's completely different. different. Yeah. We just wouldn't have a web. Oh, yeah. The very concept of a web requires uh, the idea of being able to communicate yeah, the same information from, uh, from all the things that are linked to each other. Right, yeah. And so we're still stuck here in the 80s in the world of 3D. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. It's still like everything just boils down to an FBX export at some point, and then that makes people's you know pull their hair out. Which it's getting better. I mean, we have the alliance now. We've been working on Omniverse for years. Totally. We have all of these connectors, and we're we're seeing it internally. Our work. Yeah. Just producing Jensen's keynotes. You used to be a lot harder, uh, and using our using Omniverse and our own tools and connecting all these other tools together. We can, we can do things that were just impossible before up to the last minute. I love that. Yeah, I saw some of the, I think this was for the last keynote where you, all, where you did a quick revs on all these like visuals up until the last minute for the slides. And yeah, like not having to have various layers of export is exciting. And you did hit on, you, you said Google Earth. I want to come back to that for last question. But just before that, just shifting our focus to cloud infrastructure, right? It's like, it's evident, like all these offerings that were talked about, deep search sounds super exciting. Holy crap, we've got so many assets. Which exact one is the right one for, you know, how do you even look up that stuff with semantic search? And then the graphics delivery network, right? Which goes back to this one digital twin you're distributing to so many different channels. Can you elaborate on the role of cloud in the Omniverse strategy? Because it seems to be, you know, this is like all these features thrive when the content in question resides on on uh, NVIDIA's infrastructure. Yeah, um, Omniverse is essentially designed for the cloud. Yeah. Uh, if we don't if we don't believe that the cloud is actually going to be where most of the computation is going to become, yeah. then Omniverse will be a failure fundamentally. We designed it for that purpose because our belief is that. Uh, 
of all of the applications that that we've developed uh, in every industry, 3D applications that simulate the world are are the most complex. It has the most amount of data and the potential for even more. There's never there's no limit yeah, to the so amount of data you can. Uh, use to describe a world. Totally, yeah. The amount of computation you have to do is endless. And so if you start from there, you go, well, no amount of compute is ever enough. Yeah. Certainly the device that runs on a battery that's in my hand is not going to be sufficient. Yeah. I can always use more. Um, the best place to have that compute is in the cloud. Now, if you look at every other kind of application, non-3D ones, Generally speaking, all of the compute for those applications run in the cloud. Very little is done on, on the end device. When you do a Google search or go to Google Maps, totally. uh, your email, ev everything YouTube, is, is yeah, done totally. on the cloud. Very little is done locally. But in the world of 3D, we still are in this old 80s, 90s paradigm where we transfer all of the data <laughs> to your local workstation the whole world with terabytes and terabytes of inf uh, information potentially, yeah. do a little bit of processing and send it back. Agreed, yeah. That data should live in the data center and should be processed there. And only what's needed at the edge should be computed uh, at the edge. So we've designed Omniverse around, uh, around this idea and we're building all of the infrastructure uh, from the bottom up to support it. And part of that is GDN, that's how we can deliver experiences and application, 3D applications to, to everyone, and Omniverse Cloud for the actual creators, the ones that need the advanced workstation type, uh, type experiences. So it's awesome. You've got that sort of split architecture approach, which I think is another way to your earlier point about game engines, how Omniverse is different, right? Like, yeah, again, game engines, trying to get this to run at 60 FPS on your box for a good experience there. Maybe there's a cloud angle with like, you know, massively multiplayer gameplays, but to do sorts of physics simulations and all that sort of stuff. It's all done at the edge. Yeah, yeah uh, totally right. So last question, you alluded to Google Earth and now this content uh, network too. It, it seems like, you know, Omniverse is like agnostic to the immersive form factor in which you're experiencing it. So AR was talked about, their support for geospatial data sets with cesium 3D tiles, I had a chance to work with Patrick Cozy previously. WSG84 coordinates came up. And, but there's this big problem with this world scale content piece, like piece, right? Where you've got all this amazing 3D content, you want to attach it to the world. Where do you store it? Where do you retrieve it? You know, is, is there? Y'all seem very uniquely positioned to pull off something like this. Is there a world where Nvidia would make like a public registry of content attached and anchored to the real world, like this ultimate CMS meets a CDN? Well, we're providing. Uh, a lot of the pieces to do that, the platform to do it. But we, we always kind of stop short of providing the final final layer, yeah. layer of that stack. Yeah. We don't do applications and solutions. We're not big enough to do that. Every domain has, yeah. has its own <laughs> needs. No, literally, uh, you know, we're under 30,000 employees. You can go look at other companies that are our size in terms of market cap yeah, and revenue. They're, they're, they're much bigger than us. Totally, yeah. And the way we do that is by focusing on the layers of the stack that could have the most impact. Then we partner with other, um, with ISVs and software developers, with solutions providers, with OEMs, with the whole ecosystem, so that we could take our technology and have it amplified through them to reach everyone else. So we'll build the computers, the software stack, and even help build the infrastructure in the cloud to power all of this stuff. Uh, we'll build the platform to make it easy for, for others to create these uh, softwares and, and solutions. But ultimately, it's unlikely that we will be providing that end application. That's not for us to do. That's for others to do, and we'll help anybody who wants to do it. All right, just to close things out here, what are you most excited about looking ahead at the next year? There's so much has happened in the last 12 months, right? It, almost three years worth. What are you stoked on looking at? Yeah, so uh, I was talking earlier about how we built Omniverse to help us create the most advanced AIs so we can give yeah. the AIs worlds to learn in. Um, now the AIs can help us build virtual worlds. They're becoming smart enough 
so that they can perceive our worlds and manipulate them. They don't have to just do it in the real world, they can do it in the virtual world. Uh, as you know, doing 3D is really hard. Building virtual worlds is really, really hard. There's, there aren't that many people in the world that are expert at it, that could build physically accurate virtual worlds at scale. Uh, they, the ones that are around, they're at the top studios doing VFX or at, at game studios building games. We need a lot more. If we're gonna have a 3D internet, a 3D web, then everybody should be able to create totally. this kind of content, not just a small number of elite, elite people. And so what I'm excited about is with the recent advances we have with LLMs and generative AI, we're finally getting to the point where I can see very soon we're going to have some new tools that will allow average people who don't know anything about creating 3D to be able to do some amazing things. Oh, that's going to be speaking worlds into existence, quite literally. I think that will be exciting indeed. It almost feels like the metaverse was awesome, AR, VR was awesome, but along came the technology that finally lets us populate the so-called mm -hmm. metaverse. Awesome. Exactly. Rev, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This is, this is great. Awesome.